but I'll, I'll make a start then. We are recording, brilliant. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming along this evening to our online Zoom webinar event. The event is entitled Intersectionality Action from Knowledge. This is part of a series of events that we uh, are hosting at the University of York as part of Disability History Month. Um, you can find out more information about the month, along with the university's involvement in disability equality in general, and a full program of events on the university's equality and diversity web pages. In terms of housekeeping for this evening, uh, you'll notice that we're recording the event. Uh, the intention is that we can publish this online for anyone who is not able to attend uh, and obviously make it available for people who want to rewatch. We have enabled the, the fantastic, hopefully, Zoom's auto captions. Um, if, you, if you'd like to switch those on, you could do so by pressing either the captions or CC button, which is on somewhere along the bottom of your screen. We submitted a pre-event questionnaire, uh, which was sent to everyone who confirmed their attendance via the ticketing system on Eventbrite. This hopefully has allowed people to uh, submit any burning questions that they might have. Uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to get to those at the end, uh, or perhaps Jack and, and Maria might be able to weave a response to those into their conversation as they go along. So in terms of this evening's event is an in conversation style event, uh, a discussion between our two speakers who I will introduce in just a moment. The session itself will highlight a range of Jack and Maria's personal and professional experiences in relation to disability science, being and working with LGBT and how intersectionality is viewed both in education and in wider society. The aim of the session is to equip those attending and, and anyone watching afterwards with both the confidence and the knowledge to uh, enable them to reflect on their own conduct and practices, uh, hopefully with the intention of making a positive change that will benefit someone in your personal or professional lives. Our speakers this evening are Jack Fellows and Maria Turkenberg. Jack is currently working as a science technician at a college in West Yorkshire. And while completing their BSc in chemistry at the University of York, uh, Jack became heavily involved in some of the uh, outreach projects that were organized by their department. This included the Royal Society of Chemistry's spectroscopy, sorry, it's hard to pronounce, spectroscopy in a suitcase uh, scheme, uh, along with the public science festivals that took place in New York as well. Uh, and finally, Chemistry at Work uh, project, which was uh, where Jack and Maria first met, uh, during which their joint interest in chemistry, science teaching, and all things related to uh, human beings became evident. Um, Maria, on the other hand, uh, began her professional life as a biochemist before venturing into science education and then later on science education research. By way of uh, work experience, she supported a science teacher who uses a wheelchair uh, and her interest in disability took root from then on. While Jack embarked on their PGCE after graduating, Maria maintained her interest in their progress and from there a sustained collaboration has ensued in which chemistry, science education, disability and intersectionality have always been prominent. So that's enough from me. Uh, without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to hand over to our fantastic speakers for this evening. Uh, Jack and Maria, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and um, along with tonight's uh, talk, I'll have some slides on so people can link back to um, stuff that's on the screen as well as what we're saying. And I've put some references at the bottom where appropriate. Um, so yeah, we'll move, we'll move swiftly on. Um, yeah, thanks very much again, Chris. Um, pretty much said exactly uh, what I've done throughout my life so far. Um, but I want to draw some important uh, attention to some important aspects linked to this uh, webinar, which some people might not know. Um, they are that I have a sight impairment, um, which means I use, often use a white cane outside of where I work and uh, where I live. Um, and also I am non-binary, which means my uh, gender is not uh, a man or a woman. 
and uh, my pronouns, personal pronouns that I would refer to myself as are they and them. And Maria, hand over to you. Right, well, as Chris said, uh, I consider myself to be a science education researcher. I started my professional life, well, my student life in the Netherlands, but came to York to do some more studying and plenty of work. Uh, I think my one of my, the overwhelming interests I have is to give all humans a voice. And if that can be done through education, all the better for it, I think. Um, I consider myself to be a cis woman, which is something I don't think I've ever said in public, but it, it is true, so why not? Uh, and I am white, non-British. Interesting you mention that, because I, I know you're Dutch originally. Would you say yeah. non -Bottle? I, I suppose I am. Uh, I, I even use my, my Dutch pronouns in my signature in my email, but um, I, I, I consider myself more to be European than Dutch in a way, because I've lived in Britain for such a long time. And with Brexit, that does really come to the fore for me. Um, but when it comes to surveys, I suppose I'm white other, which is why I put the white non-British here. Makes perfect sense. And um, we'll stray quickly away from Brexit that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, uh, and as a as aims and a session trajectory, like Chris said at the start, what we'd love for people to do by the end of this session is um, be more equipped with how they can change something about themselves, which would make someone who is exhibits intersectionality make their life a bit more, a bit easier, and um, with fewer barriers in their way to achieving. Um, success really. Um, stuff we're going to talk about would be in this vague order of covering what intersectionality actually is and how it affects uh, me in particular. Um, my personal experiences of the world and how I perceive others to perceive particularly disability um, and, uh, and other intersectional characteristics. Um, Maria might, Maria is going to talk about her experiences with intersectionality and how, how you got interested in the area. And we'll come back to some figures, some numbers. Um, I'll, we'll say here, and I'll say it again later, I'm not a statistician, so don't get excited for some um, exciting stats uh, because they won't be there. Um, the numbers will, but the statistical manipulation won't be. Uh, then I'll talk a bit more about othering as a concept and then um, jump back over to Maria's side of expertise, which would be UK education, uh, how intersectionality interweaves itself into the curriculum. And then we'll end on a positive and talk about good practices and hopefully give you some inspiration on something that you can do to change your own practice. Right, so give me a start then. What's intersectionality? Fantastic question. Um, intersectionality, it uh, is by way of a definition, it's the way in which forms of discrimination, such as ableism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, racism, sexism, etc., all combine and intersect, particularly for underrepresented groups. Now, it's all very well and good saying that, but we need a bit of an example. Um, I, I would anyway. So let's start with disability, for example, as it is Disability History Month, and uh, this is where this how the webinar has been advertised through that network. Um, say, for example, you are mobility impaired. That brings with it some particular adjustments that you'd need to your life. Um, say, for example, a walking aid or uh, some kind of wheelchair or anything like that. And then add to that, say you had autism as well. These two aspects of these two aspects, which could be seen as disabilities, uh, will intersect in some way, which may cause in some uh, circumstances for you to be ignored, uh, or misrepresented and therefore have ram then the ramifications will therefore ensue because of that, those intersecting characteristics. Take it a bit wider outside of disability. Take, for example, someone who has ADHD, which is attention, uh, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, which is the, the acronym, and add to the fact, and then add to that, uh, add to their personality that they're, they're black as well. Um, so you combine those two, people with ADHD face a certain raft of problems and people who are black, which is more commonly known, I think, face uh, a different range of problems in their life. And then you add on top of that, that this person's also a lesbian. So that's another raft of 
difficulties that this person may face in their life. I'm not saying that these people always face disability uh, difficulties um, because of certain aspects of their personality um, or aspects of their individual self, but these can intersect in a way which makes life more difficult than if you treated these things in isolation. So what does that mean for you personally then? For me personally, I'm going to, I'm going to treat these, I'm going to um, break it down into something, I'm going to individualise these first and then hopefully you'll, will give you a bit more of an insight into what this might mean. So let's take my sight impairment first. Um, a bit more on, on that, I have albinism, which is a lack of pigmentation in the, in the body. So my hair's white except the purple bit, that was me, just spoiler alert. I did that intentionally. Um, my hair and my eyes and skin don't have any melanin. And as a result of that, my eyes, uh, just, they don't work as well, well really. Um, so access to many everyday facilities, amenities, opportunities, etc., is um, quite restricted. And it's often not possible to, um, to do the same things without additional effort, planning and adjustments made in advance. A particular example of this would be finding a specific item, which might be at um, a, a shop out of town. For someone who is fully sighted and can drive, often you just hop in the car, drive up to a shop, and if it's not there, you might go to a different shop and then come back again and sorted. For me, that would mean looking at where the shop is, checking if there are accessible public transport routes, or if I could walk it. Usually that's about I think I think say four miles is my upper. I'd be willing to walk, but that is quite a long way still then. Um, and then ringing up, do they actually have the item, and will it still be there if when I get there? Which is another consideration. And if I want to try different shops, then I need to look at connections between those two, and look at the weather, and um, and a lot of a, a lot of additional plans and steps that need to be made just to do something which other people would see is quite straightforward. Now, uh, concentrating more on my gender identity and um, general queerness, um, um, my being non-binary uh, in the UK at the moment means that my gender identity is, cannot be reflected in any official documentation at all. Passports, I was going to say driving licence, but people who are allowed driving licence and are non-binary cannot have that represented on driving licence. And Gendered spaces are not provided on the whole for non-binary people. It's getting better, but still they don't exist for people who are non-binary. And as a result of that, there was a lot of social, uh, a lot of additional anxiety generated um, because of not belonging to that particular gendered space. So people might jump to the assumption of toilets. Yes, that's true, it's a great start, but also clothing in shops. Almost every shop is a gendered section for clothing. I don't really feel comfortable in any of them. Um, and certain products are still very gendered. Think of toiletries and things like that. They're incredibly gendered. Not Neither of which are often catered for people who are non-binary. Um, so, so what does that mean for, uh, what does the intersectionality mean in your case, in your everyday life? The intersection <clears throat> would, um, often can manifest itself in this particular example, which has happened to me before, um, meaning that someone who is a very kind, kind will stranger, so I'm not, they don't, I'm not known to them, they don't know me, uh, has noticed that I'm looking for, looking for a toilet in a, in a cafe or somewhere and offers to take me there. I take them up and I say, that'd be useful, not expect them to physically take me there, but they do and direct me to a binary gendered toilet of their choice. I haven't actually said or had the opportunity to say uh, what actually is the correct one, but they've just put me there, which it might not sound too um, difficult, but having that conversation then with someone said, actually, neither of these are suitable for me. And uh, add on top of that, they think they've done something very helpful and useful. And it can be very awkward to turn that round and say, actually, this wasn't very useful but I do appreciate the, the offer. Um, people can take offence and it can, it can get quite awkward quite quickly. So this is about perceptions, isn't it? So can you say a bit more about that then? Yeah, perception. Um, 
as I've got older, I've, I've tried to reflect on why people, what people's perceptions of a disability, I'm mainly going to focus on disability, are. On the whole, people I think are really sympathetic, people are kind and they want to do the right thing. Um, you can add, um, and that means they, they show genuine feeling towards a situation or, um, or, uh, or something similar. Empathy, on the other hand, is a lot more difficult. People try and empathise, they try and put themselves into my uh, exact situation. Um, so they try to experience my own experiences vicariously without ever having those exact experiences themselves. And my question to myself when I've been reflecting on this is, can the general pop population fully empathise with a long lived experience such as disability, such as, um, such as race, uh, such as being LGBT? And um, is it actually useful to try and empathise on this level? How this mushes together in the great blender of uh, experience and, um, and learning and interacting with people who have protected characteristics is the sympathy, is the, the feeling of, uh, is the, the feelings, the human, humanity feelings and showing that you're human. And then you mix in there some empathy, which you add into that, the lack of personal experience that that person might face. And what that boils down to when people get conflicted is I've experienced that quite frequently as pity. Um, often seen more with drunk people, uh, often at stations, say, I couldn't, I couldn't do what you do. I couldn't, well, no, because you're not me. Um, <laughs> funny, it's a bit of a surprise. It gets me every time, makes me giggle. Um, but I don't think this is a, a useful way of uh, helping people who have protected characteristics or in, are in marginalised groups. What I think would be more useful for this something you could take away yourself by the end of the webinar is let's keep that sympathy. That's good. That shows a bit of human connectivity, shows some feelings, shows something that you want to connect about. But rather than empathy, let's use the wealth of experience that that person has and use it in a positive way. And that positive way um, would be to reflect on what those experiences are. And that would boil down to a personal change. An example, um, which I've seen quite a lot actually, in, uh, particularly in where I work and uh, online and on, on the, um, just in general, day-to-day -day existence is people are wearing face masks a lot more, which is good in my opinion, um, but that, doesn't mean that it means that people who need to lip read because they have a hearing impairment suddenly that that um, ability is cut off because of a face mask physically covering someone's face rather than pitying someone and go isn't it hard and move on what you could do is use the experience that that person has who is hearing impaired to uh, possibly make a personal change for example you could get a face mask with a window in which is transparent so people can see. Or if you're if you don't meet someone with hearing impairment often, you could, uh, for example, step back, have that two meter separation, and then take a face mask down. If that works for that person, if they feel comfortable doing that, that's an alternative. Or if you work with people with hearing impairments a lot, say it's a new job or a new friend, you could even learn a bit of basic sign along or British Sign Language just to help and show that the fact you're making a personal change. It means a lot to people to show that you're, you're trying and doing something positive. So if we come back to intersectionality then, where, where does that concept come from? How long has it been around? What does it mean? This was a lovely bit of a revelation uh, for me to learn about intersectionality on a more academic level. Um, but intersectionality has come uh, or has been popularised by uh, a woman called Kimberly Crenshaw. She's uh, an American law graduate. And she published a paper in 1989 in the University of Chicago's Legal Forum about intersectionality, where she really coined that, that phrase and popularized it mainly. Um, she, the particular uh, aspect I want to focus on from this paper, which was also in her TED talk, the, the, the references at the bottom, if you want to have a look later, um, 
was the case of a woman called Emma de Graffin Reed versus General Motors. General Motors in the 70s uh, fired quite a few people or made uh, employment or um, made a lot of people unemployed. And Emma de Graffin Reed saw this was discriminatory against her. Emma de Graffin Reed is a black woman, a uh, black woman, and she felt that General Motors had unfairly dismissed her. When this came up in court, General Motors countered the fact that they are not discriminatory because they uh, equally employ women. And this was often in secretarial roles on one hand, but these were white women. But they didn't discriminate against race either because they hired black people, often black men, in the manufacturing sector of the business. So by this definition, they were not um, discriminatory because they hired women and black people. But as a black woman, Emma de Graffin Reed found herself at this intersection where she wasn't a black man, but she also wasn't a white woman. And as a result was made uh, redundant because of this intersection in her life. Another person who a lot more recently than Kimberly Crenshaw, who um, has talked about intersectionality in education, which is where we're gonna to come to later, is Jessica Pereira. She, is, uh, she works for the Institute for Race Relations and published a, uh, a, re a report, I always get that word wrong, a report in 2020 studying London schools and the criminalization of black boys in schools. She found in the paper that, uh, she found in this report that in, by way of combating criminal, uh, increased uh, convictions of boys coming out of school, that they'd identify a group of students who are particularly at risk, uh, air quotes there, at risk of um, being convicted of crimes later on in life. And this group, they looked at uh, poor behavior to try and identify the group. They also studied uh, social class. So often these people who were convicted were a low, lower social class. And they also looked at gender stereotypes and found that boys often uh, were convicted of crimes more than girls. What this boiled down to was they inadvertently targeted black schoolboys, just pretty much uniquely. Uh, and as a result of this, they brought in um, police community uh, support officers, PCSOs, to work with uh, black boys in schools, uh, as this is the at-risk group they identified. As a result, everyone saw these police coming in talking to black boys only and they thought well, that must be because they're badly behaved where well, actually it was the uh, system that identified them as being boys as being black and as being of lower social class which meant that they were targeted inadvertently Off, and now this from here this filtered down into teachers practice if for example a white boy misbehaved in an identical way to a black boy the, uh, the punishments which were handed out were drastically different. White boys were seen as, oh, it's just boisterousness, it's just growing up. However, black boys were seen uh, and punished a lot more severely because of the identical problem. And if you take the same thing of black girls versus white boy, uh, black boys, it was found that girls don't misbehave. It was, it's just boisterousness that's causing people to misbehave. They, they're not boisterous, they wouldn't, they're not gonna be, um, punished in the same way. So because of the intersection of gender stereotypes and uh, race, black boys in London found themselves uh, targeted inadvertently. And something a bit uh, obviously closer to my heart would be uh, the context of intersectionality for trans and non-binary people. Um, at the moment, UK healthcare for trans people trying to get a first appointment is um, on the scale of years. Now, after COVID, it's almost five years after initial referral to actually get an appointment with a gender identity clinic. And there's not many gender identity clinics in the world, I think, uh, in the world, in the country. Uh, I think there's only a couple. Um, primarily, this is just one in London. So you can imagine the queues are queues quite long if there's just one service. How this works for intersectionality um, means that uh, is expressed in the fact that successful applications or referral are quicker and easier um, 
if the transition from someone is a binary transition. So for example, if someone uh, is going from male to female, or man to woman, or, or vice versa, man to, uh, woman to man, those binary transitions are perceived as more normal than uh, a non-binary transition. Also, disability intersection means that uh, people who say, for example, have autism or BPD, bipolar, uh, borderline personality disorder, means that they have to often prove their mental capacities before the uh, raft of uh, psychologists and psychotherapists will approve someone's um, referral. I might also point out here that in order to uh, start any kind of medical transition, you do need to uh, pass a lot of criteria which are set by people who will never meet you, which is on a, say, a two, three, four year time scale. Um, just, to put, just to put that out there as this is how it works. And then also age as well. If, uh, young trans people uh, are now finding it more and more difficult to start transition at uh, a younger age. Uh, a medical transition, which in the UK can only um, be puberty blockers under the age of 18. There is no uh, physical surgeries or anything like that done under the age of 18. No surgeon in the country will do it. Um, so any kind of, uh, and as a result of the uh, case brought by uh, uh, Kira Bell in 2020 and 2019, um, young trans people are finding it a lot harder to access the pause button needed uh, to improve their mental health when later in life they can make more um, sound, make more uh, firm choices. So they're the intersections that, that work uh, against uh, that work in the trans area. When I was reading the British Medical Association, a lovely report was uh, a lovely quote from someone called Tom Dolphin, um, which I just wanted to put out here, just as a just a reminder of how far we've come and where we've still got to go. Uh, Thirty years ago, it was the gays, of course. We were paedophiles and perverts wanting to corrupt the moral purity of the nation. He then went on to say that we support and this is the BMA, the British Medical Association. We supported the repeal of section 28 in 2003, and we should stand with trans people now at a time where they are being subjected to a moral panic. Uh, it's a really lovely, lovely quote. So um, that's me chatted away for a while. Um, now you may be wondering, that's me done. Maria, I did ask you to, really helped me here um, and there was a really good reason I'd like you uh, can you explain expand uh, yeah absolutely uh, I suppose uh, my first interest in thinking about disability in education came from meeting a science teacher in a wheelchair who I was a personal assistant for for a while but reflecting in, in the context of this particular session I, I realized that it was actually something much, much earlier than that in my life that actually set me on this path in a way, because my dad, who was a primary school teacher, told me, and in Dutch, obviously, but I'll, I'll, I'll translate here, there's no such thing as normal. And to me, that has always been really quite important. I mean, I, I may meet average people, but normal is not some, something that you should, you should try and work from. Um, so yeah, the, the, that, that is where I started from. Can you pass on the, uh, the slide for me, please? So I, I, I met this science teacher a good 15 years ago now and started working with them. And that really opened my eyes to what it is possible to do as a disabled person, but also what limitations mean, how limitations are put on people rather than them actually being there in the first place in, in quite a lot of ways. And the, the next the next thing that happened to me at, at that point was that I met somebody who was teaching a uh, teach uh, training teachers in science education, who was also working with science teachers in, in, in a variety of uh, impairments. And that started me on the path of getting an understanding of what reasonable adjustments are. And, and we'll come back to that as well. What reason? I mean, what are reasonable adjustments and what makes them reasonable? Uh, so I started working with with them. And then somewhere along the lines, I met Jack and started thinking about intersectionality. And 
I really realized that humans and people are what I'm interested in. I mean, what 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 specific qualities they have, or what may I mean, they are all unique anyway, and that that I I found really really interesting. I suppose with Jack, I really had to start thinking about what gender means to me, and I realized that that that's something that I don't really have a very good radar for. I find that in my science education research all the time, we're meant to um, keep keep sort of keep a handle on what it means to for and I suppose at, at especially primary school we think boys and girls only but we're starting to have to think about the other genders and I I really find it immensely difficult to ask that question in the first place and to really do something sensible with the data that I get out of it so this this really got me thinking about intersectionality in in so many different directions and I realized that I could probably study it and, and think about it for the rest of my life without doing anything else. But I suppose something has to pay the bills as well. So I do a lot of other research, too. But it, it's just there is so much to it that I'd like to understand better. And that's clearly where I want to take it as as, as much as I can. I keep trying. But um, I think when it comes to research, we're going to have a look at some beautiful things that Jack has been finding. and. It's a, over, back over to you, I'm afraid. Yeah. Well, it's the audience that has to be afraid. Um, so I'm, and we're going to talk a bit, a few, a bit more about numbers. Um, like I said at the start, I'm not a statistician. There's not been um, the only manipulation of this data that's been done is by the Office for National Statistics. Um, I've just taken that data and put it here. And I'm not out to get people to... Um, take away physical numbers. I'm just out here to show what data can do to people who are intersectional. Okay, let's play a game. Um, the UK population is about 65.4 million. Let's see how um, we take that a bit further. Um, um, if we take this a bit further, we can look at uh, so take, let's take let's take people with disabilities. What percentage of the population has disability? Using the Office for National Statistics uh, and the government data, um, it's shown that uh, thirteen point nine million people in the country have uh, have declared a disability. That's around twenty one point three percent. And let's go even further. Let's take another uh, characteristic. This is where it starts to get murky. How, what percentage or proportion of the population are LGBTQ plus? From one survey, I found that 1.2 million people, that's 2.2%, are LGP, so that's lesbian, gay, and bisexual. And that was taken from um, the LGB survey in 2018. Now that doesn't include transgender or queer people and also other, other, gen other gender identities and sexualities. Um, that's just lesbian, gay and bisexual people. Now, if you also take the National LGBT Survey, which was done in 2018, or sorry, published in 2018, um, then that's uh, the total number of respondents was 0.1, uh, just above 0.1 million. And we could safely assume that all of those participants were uh, LGBTQ plus in some way. And that's only 0.17%. And obviously, that's not a full representation of the country. So hang on, how, thinking about this, how do we know how many trans people uh, or full acronym LGBTQ+, how, many, how, how do we know how many people there are in the country? And the answer is we don't really. Um, the only question about gender identity that was asked on the census was asked the year just gone. And that data has not yet been published. And that was the first time a question like that has been answered. Let's go a bit further then. Uh, and make it more, uh, make it a bit more farcical. How many religious people are there in England, Wales, and Scotland and Northern Ireland? Again, from another Office for National Statistics survey, uh, there were 37.4 million people who are just religious. Um, that's 58.4 percent. Now you can easily say here, oh, Jack, this. What do you mean, just religious? There are so many different religions, and they all have different aspects, and they all have different qualities which make them individually unique and it's like yes yes they do so amalgamating religion into one blob of data isn't really appropriate here 
And again, another one that you could add into the mix, how many people are earning state benefits? And that's um, pension, that's personal independence payment, that's child benefit, that's um, veterans benefit, that's anything like this. 50% of the population is earning some sort of benefit. And that's such a reductive view of um, someone who is intersectional. But that is often what we see with big data like this. But no, what, gonna... sorry, sorry, oh. yeah, I'm just, just going to say what this picture definitely shows is that there are many, many people intersectional because clearly some of these um, sectors are more than 50 percent. So it's unavoidable to know that there are intersectionalities going on in these data. Exactly. Exactly. Now, these data coming up in these charts um, are from the National OGD Survey, all the data is from there. It's free online if you want to go and have a look. So now I've put together a, a chart. Um, I really enjoyed the colours here, if you couldn't tell, um, which plots um, age going from the middle. Uh, so in the, the centre ring, the smallest ring is the youngest. And the largest ring on the outside is the oldest at 65 plus, and they sort of go up in increments of 10. And it's plotted the age against gender identities from the National LGBT Survey. And some interesting things to point out here that um, the number of people who identify as men has changed drastically across the generations. Um, and uh, the number of people who identify as women also has decreased in the older band. Also, the number of or proportion of non-binary people in each age bracket is about the same. Um, so it shows it's quite a cross-generational gender identity, which is quite nice to see. And then the other genders, which is in the, um, which is massive in the uh, our largest age bracket, um, it's really just an interesting point to note. Another, just another interesting thing that I found from these data was the um, proportion of declared disability. Now, from before, uh, with the hexagons, we saw that 21% of the of the population are, declare themselves as being disabled. In the National LGBT Survey, it was found that of LGBTQ plus people, about on average, about a third would self-declare as having a disability. Now, that's larger than the national average, which is an inter interesting intersection here as well within the LGBT community that there are more disabled people on the whole. Now here's where it gets a bit more, a bit more murky, a bit more uh, messy. Again, same, the smallest ring is the youngest age and the largest ring is the oldest. This is age versus sexual orientation. A few interesting things to note that um, people who say they're uh, lesbian or gay has decreased as uh, age decreases, so younger people would say lesbian or gay less. Um, and a key thing to point out, if we look at people who say their sexual identity is queer, looking at these data here, the latter two rings, which is the dark purple color, um, is not shown in these data at all. So you could easily assume that there are no queer people above the age of 45. Linking that here, now this is just silly. Okay, I'm just gonna say this is just silly but I've put age against religion. We've got a myriad of religions here, but the key thing I really wanna draw your attention to is how data is reported. I've taken a screenshot of the uh, table from which I got these data. And you can see in this region with the white circle around it, it says that uh, people who are LGBTQ and Hindu just don't exist. That's not true. The reason why it's reported as a zero is because below certain numbers and certain proportions, people become identifiable when you're reporting on data such as these. So the number becomes so small that you could say, hey, this is, this is you because you're the only one who said you're Hindu, disabled and uh, a gay man. That must be you. And as a result of this, ethically speaking, it can't be reported. I suppose it's it's stronger than that, Jack. This table shows you that if there if there would have been a zero in their box, that would mean that there aren't any. But the fact that there is an X there means that there are some, but we can't show them in the table because they would automatically be identifiable, and that's why. 
and that's the crucial thing about uh, data like this. And, and this makes people and certain communities and certain populations completely invisible when trying to report on data such as these. At low numbers, it becomes unidentifiable, like we just said. So Maria, you, you, this is something you know a bit about. What can we do about this problem? Um, when it comes to numbers, the, the data becomes identifiable, so we can't put um, put them out there in the, in the research um, community. But of course, there are people who would like to be identifiable. That makes it a little bit easier to, to study them, to work with them. You can you can study individuals, you can study small groups of people and make them identifiable because that it's just completely unavoidable. Unavoid, but it is not in, unethical to do that if the person themselves want to do it that way. What then becomes the problem, I suppose, is that these people are the ones that are going to be asked time and time and time again for their stories, for their data, for they're, they're going to be asked probing questions. And again, in itself, that's not unethical, but it becomes really quite tiresome i guess to be at the at the receiving end of all those questions from researchers and from studies so yes it can get pretty tiring you could also do a, a recorded webinar so they could look back at it later <laughs> um i want to briefly touch on othering a concept of othering i'm not going to go into too much detail because of time but um educational othering is something i've i've seen quite often uh, especially in, in practice, very subconsciously and uh, without any malice whatsoever, but it's good to be aware of. So for example, um, people's educational abilities are applied to what uh, characteristic they exhibit. So people who are black and minority ethnic groups, uh, students who are SEND, so there's that special, special educational needs and disabilities, women and girls, LGBTQ students, are given these traits. So for example, uh, LGBTQ students are like, oh, they're, they're arty, aren't they? Speaking as a chemist, I'm not very arty myself, um, so I wouldn't like to personally be, be attributed that trait. Um, and these traits can, can be used to justify um, like uh, personally, uh, personal academic ability, etc. cetera. Um, a great book, if you're interested in this, is one by Angela Sani. It's uh, it's about race science and it's called um, Superior, the Return to Race Science. Interest in this area, really useful. But speaking of, um, speaking of that, you could also link that back to the concept of phrenology in the 60s, which was used to justify the fact that people of color were of lesser um, social and, and so social worth really because of this concept of phrenology it's rubbish by the way um it's measuring bumps on people's head to uh, to dictate what they're going to be in the future and that was used systemically uh, quite frequently but going back to um uh, just going to have just a to touch on my own experiences um of intersectionality um, and how this is applied to me. Uh, tips for fully sighted people. I've uh, I had to reinvent the wheel, certainly, on my PGCE. So, for example, the concept of exit cards, which is when you give a student a bit of paper and they write down the answer to a, a quick question, and then a teacher can flick through and just get a con just get a grasp of how the students have learned the particular concept. I couldn't do that because I had to invent uh, to write my own resource so that I could physically read it, ask the students to write in big handwriting. Any teachers out there, you'll know that's easier, much easier said than done. Um, and then try and, as well as assign a portion of my brain to physically reading, which is a lot more difficult for me, um, had to then make judgments on my future teaching practice from the responses. And one, they didn't really work, to be honest. Um, um, Another thing that I know Maria will talk about later is, is support for SEND students, but there is nothing for SEND teachers. Especially when in the PGCE. And then the no. risk of um, 
Yeah, sorry, you're going to say something, memory. No, it's it's absolutely true. I mean, the, the, uh, students in schools, students at university, maybe they get a lot of support offered. They can take it or leave it, but by the time you're out of university or out of school, they're just you're just left with your own your own devices. So there's nothing available for the teacher trainer because for teachers, there's nothing. Yeah, um, getting a house uh, and a friend of mine, uh, well, ex part of the time, looking for a house. I'm visibly disabled. I use a white stick. Um, he also has uh, autism, which wasn't very visible, but we're both both quite queer. We made 24 separate house applications for rent, none of which were approved when we know that they were getting let to people. Um, and we really felt this was because of the fact that we were intersectional. We could, they could easily say, we rent to people who are disabled, we rent to people who are LGBT, but we found ourselves at that crossroads of being both. Does this apply to someone that you know? Yeah, let's come back to Maria. Back to my turn and back to some numbers first, because I, I really was struck by this particular graph that I found in a report about mental health disorders, 2017, so it's fairly recently. And I found it really quite, uh, well, in your face and scary to think that students with mental, young people with mental health disorders, the first port of call in their quest for support almost half of them would go for a, to a teacher first and other educational professionals are, are targeted quite high on that list as well. Now, that, that I mean, that's what you have to deal with as a teacher and it makes sense that a, a, a child would trust you. But are you actually equipped as a teacher? What does a teacher then do? How do they respond? Are they trained for something like that? And I think that is really something to keep in mind. So I suppose we should have a, a bit of a look at what happens in schools, really, and what should be happening in schools as well. Um, I started from the UNESCO, which is a, a global organization that's that's um, uh, to do with uh, education. And they are really looking at transformative education and their their main um, uh, uh, factories in, in their thinking about a transformative education is that that can really only work if the student at the receiving end of it feels safe and valued and respected in their situation. Now that, as we've already heard from Jack, can be quite an interesting one. Um, I suppose in the, in the UK context, there is a specific curriculum uh, uh, um, uh, I don't know what the word is now. We'll come back to that. Uh, the personal, social, and health education curriculum and the relationship and sex education curriculum is what would would allow teachers to uh, to bring in things about intersectionality, for example. That's what I was trying to look for. So I had a, a good. Can you put the next slide, please? Uh, are, are people with disabilities and stuff talked about in in? Oh, we shall get to that. They are. To a degree, but I suppose what, what really strikes you when you start reading the guidance for the PSHE curriculum, the first thing is that it's not a statutory subject. So a school is not meant to put on lessons for PSHE. They're meant to incorporate it into anything and everywhere. And it's, it's not meant to be a compulsory subject, but some of the content is compulsory. So there really are things that need to be taught. For example, that that students really need to get some sense of, oh, yeah, I should say first, this is not meant to be read. It, it all comes off the web from the guidance for the PSHE curriculum. And I think the, the text is important for maybe the recording and seeing later, and you can, you can get the, the slides afterwards if you want, so you can read it at your leisure. But I've put it all here, and in some ways that made me realise that it puts Jack and me on an equal footing because there's no way anybody can read this quickly enough while I'm talking over it as well. So I'm going to try and paraphrase. Um, so yes, PSHE, not a curriculum on its own, but students are meant to be learning about the law, about what is legal in relationships and how they should make decisions in a legal sort of way and what the Equality Act is all about. So there's a lot of legal stuff in the curriculum that come there. And also that schools are at least allowed and sometimes even encouraged to take positive action when it comes to thinking about their local situation, their cohort, if there is a good reason to do something specific in the, in the curriculum before specific groups of students in their school, for example, they must or they should at least. Um, and they really should go into good practice and we shall definitely come back to that in a minute. So can you put the next one on please? Um, 
there's uh, there's a lot of mention of positive action like like i said if if the the the, the cohort really warrants that uh, but they it does go into protected characteristics that's mentioned as a, as a phrase and it immediately homes in on that people with protected characteristics might be potentially be at greater risk yeah i mean it, it would what does risk mean Ah, uh, well, it, it, that's that's a very good, it, it doesn't outline that, and it doesn't outline how you would bring that in, and how you would judge that, and how you would um, ameliorate it. So, it, it, that that as a, yeah, those students are potentially a greater risk, so we must do something for them, but nobody really says what and how. Um, it, 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 it mentions gender, yes, but it goes into boys and girls, obviously, which in, in a lot of schools is, is what comes to mind first. But it does um, hint at the need for respect and the need for the environment where the limits are should be challenged. So there, there is a, 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 an option and allowance for that and gender and other characteristics are specifically mentioned in that context. And then the guidance also highlights, and this is, I think, is where I need to quote the words, Issues such as everyday sexism, misogyny, homophobia and gender stereotypes, sexual violence, sexual harassment, because they are not acceptable, will never be tolerated and are not an inevitable part of growing up. That's what it literally says in the guidance that that should be part of what schools do. And I think especially that that last um, that last phrase, it's not an inevitable part of growing up, really should be taken to heart, uh, I think, in, in what schools do. So coming back to disability on the next slide, I was looking for, is disability represented in the PSHE curriculum? Can you actually teach about disability on the back of the PSHE curriculum? That's what we, that was one of the things I was trying to look for. But when you try and find SEND in, the, in that curriculum document, it so obviously is geared towards teachers making an effort to differentiate in their classrooms and to really be mindful of cognitive abilities in their students. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't really allow for anything beyond that. And so there's, I think that was a real missed opportunity to bring intersectionality into, into, the, uh, into the picture. And I think Jack should really say something about the, the learning about disability and how that went in, in their growing up. This, is, this seems really reductive um, way of educating people by the fact that you sh the way uh, SEND is sort of reduced into how are you going to do in education and it's for the teachers, not for students to learn from each other. Um, thanks for bringing me in because I think genuinely, I think my friends at school that I grew up with only know about sight impairment because I grew up with them. And that I think that can be linked to so many different other intersections uh, in society, you only know about this particular characteristic characteristic of someone because you grew up with them. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I suppose it is difficult for teachers, I and mean, it comes back to the sympathy, empathy, personal change thing. I mean, how how do you, as a, a, an average PSHE teacher who doesn't even exist in a way because they don't have to exist, so it's usually science teachers or uh, form tutors or maybe uh, PE teachers who get into the, the, the swing of, of teaching the PSHE. How, how do you gr grapple with all of this? How, what, what do you know that equips you to be able to do this? So if we look at the next slide, which is the, the, the two paragraphs on LGBTQ, or actually rather it was just LGBT to be fair, in, in that curriculum, it, it, it is there. But, and that, uh, I suppose, as LGBT, that, that's where it stops, maybe doesn't surprise us completely. But especially in this section, there's a lot of the phrase, schools should ensure. And I kept thinking that there were definitely some things in there that really should be more than that. It should be must rather than should. But maybe that's going to happen one day. Um, who knows? And then there's another phrase in there that really struck me, which is the timely point things need to be done age appropriately and I, I suppose we would all like that to be true but what is that and is that that's clearly not the same for every child anyway so how do you decide and who decides what uh, age appropriate and timely is in that case and it really makes you think that 
this is going to be sort of brought in at some point just for a lesson, just to make sure that it's done before the end of the school, um, compulsory schooling. And it, it, it would be so much better if it could just be there all the time. It was part of the culture and it, and it really wouldn't have to be brought in as a, as a little thing at some point. And who does it let down most? Does it let down the people who maybe could know about it or does it let the people know, let people down who really need to know about it down most? I, I personally go for the latter. Mm, absolutely. So I suppose we need to start thinking about good practice. And yeah, that, that, that uh, is, is an interesting one. Uh, it, it's not easy to find any, uh, any evidence of good practice because the, this new curriculum, it really was only brought in in 2020. And we all know how 2020 wasn't maybe the best time for things. The, the, there is a, an organization called the PSHE Association who is really quite uh, well, um, well, uh, well liked and, and suggested that schools would uh, refer to them. But even they, they've only just about started to ask for good practice from what, what is going on in schools and just to collect the evidence and the research out there because uh, it's, it just isn't, isn't there yet. But clearly, that's what we would like to achieve: is to get the best practice out of the best out of the PSHE curriculum, so that so that um, um, we all get get the, um, the 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 benefit from it. Now, I think that the, the third the third point no, this is the second point. You've changed it, Jack. That's fine. Uh, the the, the uh, it seems to be especially related to disability presumably but but maybe for other protectors but for disability the reasonable adjustments thing comes back there and it it has really struck me how it it's only leadership people who have an understanding of what that might mean is where things might actually work because i mean it, it's quite frustrating in a way but it, it's it's quite a woolly phrase i mean what does it mean and that some, sometimes, unfortunately, means that it just gets overlooked because nobody wants to make a decision about what reasonable actually is. But it's, it's only in places where the leadership does seem to have a, a, a handle on it, where staff and students are just allowed to request things and it makes their life better. But that's, it, it is a limitation of the leadership where, the, where that actually, actually happens. And the more I learn about reasonable adjustments, the more I've realized that there are quite a lot of things that are considered to be reasonable adjustments specific for some some people, one person, that are actually so useful for the rest of us, the rest of, yeah, that's not the right way to say it, but for, for everyone, if those reasonable adjustments were just enshrined in law as something that would just need to happen everywhere, it would make life better for all of us rather than it having to be put on specifically for somebody and that that i think is is something that i would see as good practice just make that the the, the standard um clearly there is now the need for and and the allowance for a designated mental health lead in every school and that starts to make good sense but i'll come back to why that might be a tricky one because where like where does where does a, a person go for support is a is an interesting one and i recently had a discussion with some people at the university here who said when it comes to intersectionality every time a student with a multiple protected with multiple protected characteristics oh that's so hard to say need they need to make a decision about which support service to attack are they looking for somebody who's going to help them with their disability or are, are they going to look for somebody who helps them with their racism issues? Wouldn't it be so much better if we could make the support services completely joined up? Because clearly, if, if somebody starts, starts from their disability support officer, this person is going to have to ask for advice from somebody else. What if we had one support service where, as an intersectional person, for want of a better word, you could just you, you would know where to go it's a holistic approach we would know where to start and we and it would all uh, seamlessly work together um but it does mean that 
there is a, a big need for training because clearly somebody who's a, a very successful and, and a, a effective disability officer doesn't necessarily have the equipment to deal with intersectional approaches. And there are difficult conversations to be to be held. And there, there is, there's actually training on holding difficult conversations, but that's actually geared up for how to fire somebody, for example, how to sack them. So there's other difficult conversations to be to be trained about, um, I suppose. And then there's one complete um, kind of worms that we might not uh, go to into at all. But parents have the right for their children to be withdrawn from certain aspects of the BSAG curriculum, namely the sex education part. And what is really, really quite interesting is that schools have to allow for a student to get the sex education before the end of their, their, their compulsory school days, even if their parents think otherwise. And so there's, there's quite a, a big section of can of worms that is actually definitely for another conversation, I think. And um, moving on to some good practices. Thank you, Maria. I'm going to touch on a few of those as well. Um, some good practice that I've seen throughout my uh, lifetime so far is I'm going to start with the University of York, uh, shameless plug there, the chemistry department where I did my undergrad. Um, uh, I've got permission from Alex to mention him, but he's worked so hard with the people in the equality and diversity department at, uh, at chemistry at York to um, which has allowed them to achieve a 10 year Athena Swan gold award, which is an award that shows continual improvement on equality and diversity. There's a Royal Society of Chemistry um, article, links in the references below. Uh, so that's amazing practice that done there. Conversations with employers, um, a job I have uh, had before, um, I'm not gonna say which job, well, it, I'm not gonna say which job, but this was really good. Uh, got the job and within a week, the head of health and safety, my line manager, um, just sat down and said, right, what works for you? What can we do? We've seen these problems. Have you foreseen any problems which we are unaware of because of your site that might be able to help you and because your gender identity, which we can help you with? And I said, yes, these things will be really helpful. And they said, we can do that. We can do that. That probably is involves, a, a, let's say, building work, for example, um, which is a lot more tricky in terms of reasonable adjustment. And I was aware of this. Um, but you don't ask if you don't, you don't get if you don't ask. But that was such a good interaction. Um, the diversity, uh, sorry, the diverse working environment is a Royal Society of Chemistry report published in 2018. Which the key headline from that is the more diverse your workforce, with any kind of diversity, the better your output. So the more people of color you have, the more religions you have, the more gender identities you have, the more disabilities you have in your workplace, the better you will function as a team because of that diversity. Can I can I stick in there for a second? Because I mean, the, it's a it's a very 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 minute example, but uh, it is very well known in engineering circles, for example, and the research really backs that up. That an engineering environment where there's only men is limiting, whereas if they bring in women, they somehow seems to bring something to engineering that the men just can't, and that's just men and women. And just engineering. I think how far that could go. And that's what this report from the RSC has shown. Uh, a more of an anecdotal one this time. Um, a colleague, uh, another uh, placement, um, she came in one morning and just said, hello. And by the time I'd, I'd sort of dragged myself away from the computer, turned around and squinted at who it might be, it was, it was I, just, I could hear someone crashing around, but I didn't know who it was. Um, and then later in the day, she said, have you been in a mood this morning? I I don't know why. I said, oh, I said hello, and he didn't say anything. Like, oh, I didn't know that was you. And she thought, oh, okay. Then went away. Next morning, came in, said, hello, Jack. And I was like, ah, oh, hello, Jack. It's such and such. And immediately that just made me feel a lot more involved in that conversation, which is fantastic. Another hello was um, Transport for London and London North Eastern Railway have started saying, hello, everyone. Hello, hello, passengers. Hello, customers which immediately includes everyone, uh, not just ladies and gentlemen. Right, um, what needs to change? This is a penultimate, penultimate part, we're nearly there. Maria, 
Yeah, well, one of the things clearly the Equality Act can't stay the way it is because it doesn't allow for Jack to be represented in forms and, and everything else. And I mean, Jack can't possibly be the only one. So, yeah, the Equality Act is, is incomplete at best. And well, I'm sure you've got other words for that, Jack, but we might <laughs> might never get to that. Uh, holistic approach to services. Clearly, there, there must that surely there must be a way for people to not have to make decisions on the basis of their their intersectionality on where to go first and where to go next and just get it right for everyone first time round. And that then comes into what, how, the holistic approach to education. Can, can we make PSHE properly cross curricular? And who's going to do this? Are they trained properly? Can they do it justice? And uh, thank you for that. And, and I love that holistic approach. Wouldn't it be amazing to just go to somewhere and have all your intersectional needs just in a lovely bubble of warm care and, and, and compassion? Um, maybe you're in that position to make a change such as that in your institution, in your uh, workplace, or in your friendship group. What I would love for people to do from this webinar is um, think about someone you know who is intersectional or exhibits intersectional characteristics, reflect on what you do, your interactions um, with that person or, or, or your business structure, um, and how can you make a change to that person's life? No doubt if you make that, person, that change to that person's life, you will make changes to other people's lives as a result of that be that professional, social, managerial, um, or activistic. And this is where we've reached the end of our webinar. And if there are any questions in the form, um, I'd like to do a few special thanks actually. Thank you for Chris for putting this together and emailing me in the first place. Um, thank you to Maria for agreeing to um, have this conversation. Um, and I would like to thank Alex Palmer who um, helped me a lot with just his expert knowledge on this. Um, and it was very, very useful to have him in the background working with me. Back to Chris, I think. Thank you both. Thanks so much for that. I think it's been an incredibly enjoyable and uh, stimulating uh, event to, to hear your insights and experiences this evening. I'm sure everyone would agree that there's there's a lot to take away from this session. Um, there's been a lot of really good events uh, throughout Disability History Month, and I think it's it's really useful to, for us to end on an event which is so practically minded as, as well as being rooted in intersectionality uh, as well. Um, as Maria mentioned, I, I will share the slides with everyone who uh, has attended, as well as uh, a link to the recording once it's up online and, and you can watch some of our other events uh, that we've that we've done. However, there's other stuff going on as well in the city uh, for uh, Disability History Month, um, and you can find out more information about that as well. So I'm um, conscious of time. So finally, uh, I'd like to thank Jack and Maria again for sharing their wonderful insight and experience uh, this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, to, to hear you both deliver this talk, uh, and there's so much for us to, to go away and reflect on. Uh, with some really practical suggestions and, and starting points. So, yeah, thank you both very much once again. Thank you. Um, thank you. I've also put my Twitter handle. I'm not very active on there, but if you do have something specific um, which you really want my own personal opinion on, um, then I'm at chemistry underscore NB, which is E-N-B-Y. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everyone.